I want to welcome you this morning. We have guests here today. We're so glad that they're here. You know, uh, we want to wish everybody a, a happy and a blessed Sabbath. One of a long line of Sabbaths that goes clear back to the creation of the world. Sabbath is God's idea. And he rested right after the creation week, giving us a wonderful example, right? Uh, the Sabbath now becomes a memorial to the creator God. No wonder in the final message to the world, before Jesus comes, it says, worship him who made what? Heaven and earth and sea and the fountains of waters. All this is going to be challenged in a big way one of these days soon. And so we need to be well grounded. When you learn a new truth, what do you do with it? You pound the peg deep. The devil has a big foot. He'd like to kick it over. Throw your arms around truth whenever you learn truth uh, and don't let it go. This morning I would like to start out with some verses that I think are familiar to most every one of us. Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. Those of you who are students of Revelation will recognize these verses very readily. I want to start with verses 1, 2, and 3, and then drop down to 11 to 13. Revelation chapter 13, and we'll start with verse 1. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast raise up out of the sea. I like to call this one the sea beast, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his Horns, ten crowns, and upon his heads the, the names of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. They were in great wonder of this Spectacle, okay? And then we'll drop down to verse 11. And I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. I like to call this one the earth beast. And he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exercised all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders that, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Verse 14 starts, and I'm going to read that one a little bit later, but it says he deceives everybody on the earth. Did you ever meet somebody that said, you know, today I just had the most wonderful experience. I've just been deceived. Anybody like that? Did you ever hear anybody like that? Anybody have that experience? Nobody likes to be deceived. And here is a beast power. In the, in the prophecies of the Bible, these beasts represent powers, okay? Empires even, uh, powers that be. And uh, this beast deceives the whole earth and revives the first beast before him. This is not my subject today. My subject of today is in Christ. There's no place else to be except in Christ. Otherwise, we'll be filled with fear and foreboding and doomsday. Can't be that way. You can't live that way. God put us in the midst of this world, and we're here for a purpose. And that purpose is what? To make him known. The God of goodness and mercy and justice and love. And he's going to save his people out of this dark world one of these days. And we don't have to worry about anything. There are three beasts mentioned in these verses we just read. The sea beast, the earth beast, and the dragon. Actually, that's all the beasts there are in the book of Revelation. That simplifies the book greatly. The beast from the sea. You know, all the major reformers 
We're Protestants here this morning. Is that right? In the main, I think we're Protestants this morning. And if I say something this morning that what might be in a, even a little bit of a way, uh, a little bit discouraging to somebody who might have a, have a belief in the, in the Catholic Church, I'm not talking about people here today. I'm talking about a system. The reformers looked at the sea beast. All the major reformers, Luther, Melanchthon, Baxter, Ridley, uh, Calvin, without exception, they looked at this beast as the Roman power, the medieval church. They lived in the 15, 14, 15, 1600s. Without, without, uh, without any, uh, any hint of uh, a shame, they talked about this and they talked about it very strongly. The beast from the earth, otherwise known as the false prophet, who deceives the whole earth, and uh, causes miracles at the end time. This beast revives the sea beast from the deadly wound, and together with the dragon, they form a, a formidable threefold union. If you hold your finger where you're at here in the Bible, and let's turn to Revelation 16, verse 13. Revelation 16, verse 13. This threefold union I was talking about is put together in this verse, Revelation 13, 16, verse 13. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the what? The dragon. And out of the mouth of the beast, that's the sea beast, and out of the mouth of the what? False prophet, that's the, that's the one who deceives the whole earth. False prophet, that's why it's called that in this, in this verse. That is the earth beast. I'm not going to get into all that this morning, but just to know that it's there. In Revelation, this threefold union is called Babylon. In Revelation, this threefold union is called Babylon. Let's look at Revelation chapter 16, still in that chapter, and verse 19. Revelation 16 and verse 19. Why is it important to talk about this? We're there. We're watching a threefold union develop right in front of our eyes. And we ought to be cognizant of that fact. Verse 19 says, in the great city, talking about Babylon, and the great city was divided into how many parts? Three. Three parts. And the cities of the nations fell, and the great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. This isn't always going to be this way. Changes are coming. A demonic religion, I must say it this way, a demonic religio, political power who makes war with God's kingdom in the last remnant of probationary time. A threefold union, if you will. This sets the prophetic setting for the three angels' messages. Threefold union, three angel messages follow in the very next chapter, chapter 14. While the threefold union is developing by demonic power, there is a threefold message emanating from the most holy place of heaven's sanctuary on the sides of the north where the throne room is. I'm glad there's a throne room. I'm glad that God sits on that throne, aren't you? We need not fear for the future uh, when we think about that. That message comes from, emanates from heaven's sanctuary and heralded by the people of God on earth. In Daniel 11, it's called glad tidings. It comes from the east and from the north. And the whole world followed and worshiped the beast in great wonders. And while the threefold message from God calls the earth people out of Babylon, out of the confusion and fear of these last days. In the past two decades, a tremendous resurgence of papal influence has been taking place. Have you noticed that? 100 years ago, the Vatican, which is a little piece of real estate composed of about 108 acres. You all have some kind of a sense that's not too many acres, is it? 
100 years ago, the Vatican had only 14 nations with diplomatic representation in the Vatican. But today, there are 87 nations, including Protestant and non-Christian nations. Expect in the next few months a huge council um, of national and religious leaders to converge on the, on the Vatican. Plans are already underway. In fact, it would, I, if my understanding, remember, memory is right, it would have already taken place had it not been for the COVID virus. A worldwide council is still on the, in the making for the purpose of Christian unity, environmental concerns of many nations. This is, this is the glue that's gonna bring this together. Have you ever heard anything about environmentalism and global warming? It's all over the news. Seas rising, hurricanes, destructive tornadoes, and so forth. These environmental concerns are going to be seen as the great uniter of Christians and non-Christians alike because <clears throat> I was watching a documentary on Florida. The seas are rising. It's true. I, I, I don't dis, disbelieve in global warming. I think there is such a thing as global warming. I think the world's been warming for a long time now, ever since the Ice Age, shortly after the flood. It's still warming. And uh, it is causing the seas to rise. There was a time when the seas were a lot lower than they are now. They're rising again. And uh, people love the oceans, right? And so where, where do the majority of the people live? Right along the oceans, on the East Coast and the West Coast. And this idea is quickly replacing the everlasting gospel of Jesus Christ. Hope for the world, the only hope is Christ. It's not what we do with the earth or, you know, uh, it's a scene of doom and gloom, saving the earth. Now, I suspect that we're all environmentally concerned. I am. We should be kind to the animals, right? I believe that. The Creator desires that we take good care of the earth. Adam and Eve were asked to dress and what? Keep it. What does that mean? Keep the earth. <laughs> take care of it. And the animals, we heard in Sabbath school class, Adam and Eve, what did they do? They named the animals. They loved those animals, and the animals loved them. In a perfect world, this was, this was, this was wonderful. But environmentalism, but environmentalism in the present world is an evolutionary and an atheistic idea. The idea is that it took billions of years for the earth to evolve and create all these animals and, and the vegetation, billions of years, and we're gonna destroy it in just a few, few decades. See, that's the idea. So this has in itself become sort of a religion. Environmentalism is growing out of the fear about those things which are coming upon the earth. Fires and windstorms, floods, distort, dis, dis, uh, orders of every kind, wars, rumors of wars. How many of you have heard about the fires on the West Coast? There are people here this morning who've been displaced from that place and, there, and more are coming. Jim, I'm so pleased about your kindnesses. Okay. My pleasure. Well, you don't mind if I tell them that you were in the fires. Their house was the only one that was preserved. They're here this morning. Men's hearts failing them for fear of what's coming upon the earth. You see any of that around? People are on edge. The third angel even warns about the mark of this beast power. All this grows out of fear. If you make people afraid of, of if you make people afraid enough, well, they'll do anything. Environmentalism, environmentalism at present is largely a secular idea, and Sunday laws will be designed to give Mother Earth a rest. These plans are already underway. One day of rest, no cars on the roads, no trucks, no factories spewing out their, their toxins. One day, that gives the earth, Mother Earth, a chance to rest. 
and help the, this is, this, is the, this is the plan. This is the plan. And can you guess what day that's going to be? It's not going to be the memorial of the creative power of God, for sure. Already talked about is the first day of the week. Far-fetched, it's already being talked about, rumored around this country, and this will yet become a tremendous worship idea. I want to read from Revelation 13 again. So turn with me to Revelation 13, 14 to 16. Revelation 13, 14 to 16. We're going to finish up the verses that we didn't read. Here's what it says. Talking about this earth beast now. Verse 14. If you have it, say amen. And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by the sword and did live. You know, the book of Revelation is a glossary, literally a glossary of Old Testament ideas. And this is a, this is a throwback to Daniel chapter 3. The three Hebrew worthies were, were called on to bow down to an image, right? A golden image. And they didn't want to do that. In the end of time, there's going to be another image formed, an image to the beast. In verse 15, he had power, that is the earth, earth beast, had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causes all of them, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. A huge union of church and state is coming. Only this is going to have global, global proportions. Sunday is coming. We're living in the feet and toes of the great metal image, the great metal man of Daniel 2. Prophecy is fast fulfilling. So the appeal of these two ideas, one secular, environmentalism, the other religious, Sunday, these will easily cross ideological and cultural barriers. Very easy to do that. In the 1880s, Sunday laws were strong. Were you aware of that? A.T. Jones went before the U.S. Congress to appeal, to, to appeal these laws. And they were combined with something good then, too. I think environmentalism is good. Don't you think so? It's a good thing. In the 1880s, the Sunday laws were combined with temperance laws. Is temperance good? <laughs> Avoiding that which is harmful and using with, with uh, uh, restraint, those things that are good, okay? Great things are happening now and continue to, continue to unfold in the fulfilling of Revelation 13. Time is running out. We're closer to the second coming right now than we've ever been before. Spirit of Prophecy says the latter rain may be falling all around us and not be perceived by everybody. And counsels have been given to us, get ready, get ready, get ready. We should be stepping on our tiptoes. Uh, I'm just exercising my knee right now. But <clears throat> You've all read that. For those of you who have great controversy, I would like to suggest a Sabbath afternoon read, Sabbath afternoon read, chapter 35. An important read in this connection. All these things. What are we going to do about it? I'm going to, I'm going to switch gears now to a whole different subject. What are we going to do about this? I'd like to read our scripture reading again. I think we have time for this. Turn with me to Ephesians again. Let's take a look at this. This almost reads like it's written for the 20th century. Ephesians chapter 6. Paul there in the, in the prison. He's looking at this guard dressed in Roman armor and weapons 
watching guard over him, and he, must have thought, he might have thought, wow, <clears throat> this is what God's people need. They need, need to be equipped like that Roman guard, okay? Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 19. Let's just take all the comfort we can out of this. Finally then, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. I like that expression, in the Lord. There's no other place to be right now. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood and against the principalities and against the powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done, done all to stand. Standing, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye will be able to quench the fiery darks of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation, And the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Everybody has their sword this morning, right? I just love to hear the pages rustle. This is where it's at. This is the mind of Christ. This is is the word of God to to this generation. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance, and supplication for all saints. Wow. Let's look at another one. In answer to the question, what do we do about all of this? Second Thessalonians, I'm sorry, Second Corinthians. I have Second Thessalonians coming up. Second Corinthians. 10 verses 3 to 5. 2 Corinthians 10 verses 3 to 5. I try to memorize these texts, and I, I have friends who have been truckers, 10 4. You know what that means? 10 4 is, is, a, is a wonderful passage in this, in this chapter. Let's start with verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war against after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself, itself, itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to, obedience, to the obedience of Christ. That's where we need to be. Jesus is really coming in power and glory. Let me ask you a question. Do you want to see Jesus come? Amen, amen's all over the place. This congregation is like that. You say that's a foolish question. Of course we want to see Jesus come. What if I ask the question a little differently? Do you want Jesus to come if you're not ready? That's a woeful thing even to contemplate. Many choose to live life on their own terms, some most of the time, while others live on God's terms, design law. Nobody, everybody here, I think, would be foolish to call up up on this high roof and jump down on on the ground, design law. I'm not talking once saved, always saved here. Let's look at one of the most encouraging verses in all the Bible. It's 1 John 5. If you're a student of the Bible, this is something you've probably already memorized. 1 John 5, 9 to 14. Take all the comfort you can out of a verse like this. I know that 1 John comes after 1 Peter. 1 John 5, 9 to 14. 
Third verse 9. First John 5. If we receive witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God that which he hath testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave his Son. And this is the record that God hath hath given us. What is the tense in this verse? Past tense. God hath given us eternal life. And his life is in his son. That's like John 5, 24, which says, he that believeth on the son has eternal life, right? He that hath the son hath life. He that hath not the son, God hath not life. Son of God hath not life. Now notice verse 13. That's the reason I'm reading this. These things have I written unto you, that you believe on the name of the son of God, that ye may what? That ye may know. There's a confidence in all of this. We don't have to live in a world of fear. Know that ye have eternal life, that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. And this is the what? Confidence. confidence. This is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything uh, according to his will, he does what? He hears us. You know, our will needs to be in harmony with his will, right? Right? This is full assurance when you take the gospel seriously. The prophetic prophecies of Revelation are not designed to bring fear. We read some pretty tough scriptures here in the very beginning. These are not designed to bring fear. They are the testimony of Jesus. That's what the spirit of prophecy is. It's the testimony of Jesus. It's his thoughts. Anybody here afraid of Jesus? (laughs) When we read the great prophecies of the Bible, they are the testimony of Jesus. They're his witness about what he wants us to know and understand and believe. We have not been brought to this time by the spirit of fear. Salvation is by, is, is salvation and righteousness is by faith. But we must be sure that our faith is not a presumptuous faith, but a genuine faith. To look to self by trying harder is to look in the wrong place. John 15, 5 says, without me you can do what? Nothing. Don't try harder. That's not how we get there. On the other hand, Philippians 4, 13, does anybody know what that says? I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Okay. So there needs to be a, a matching up. Uh, you know, uh, last week I used a little illustration. Uh, Mark Anthony, Mark Anthony. It said of him, you know, the Roman. It said that he one time hitched up two lions together to pull his cart. How do you think that happened? How many of you have a cat? I don't believe that ever happened, do you? (laughs) But he does want us to yoke up with Jesus. The lion of the tribe of Judah, he wants us to line up with that, to yoke up with him. He says, my yoke is easy and light. So we live in the tension between these two areas. I can do nothing, and I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. justification and sanctification. They're like two oars of a boat. If you have only one oar in a boat and you're in the middle of the lake and you just pl- pl- and what, what, what's going to happen? <laughs> you just go round and round in circles. But these things go together. Ephesians 1 verse 3. I would like to have us look at that one. Ephesians is one of those wonderful books. You know, the letters, the letters to the church, the letters to the different churches by Paul you can almost tell what that church was like by the instruction that he gives. For instance, in Galatia, they were teaching a false gospel, weren't they? And so he gives them the gospel and more of it in Galatians, particularly chapter 3 and onward. But Ephesians 1, verse 3, if there be any doubt, notice what it says, 
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with what? All spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. How many spiritual blessings? All blessings. Every spiritual blessing comes from the throne room of the universe. There's not a loaf of bread on our table that does not come from the, from the blood that, that emanates from the cross of Christ. And in the book of Revelation chapter 5, we have a view into the most holy place, into the throne room of the universe. In the midst of the throne is a lamb as though he had been freshly slain. Cross is in there too. Spiritual blessings, how do we receive them? Do we receive them from Christ? Don't answer this question now. <laughs> I don't want to embarrass anybody. Do we receive these blessings from him? Or do we receive them in him? Now the Bible is very clear about this. We just read a text in Ephesians 1.3 that says, every spiritual blessing comes where? In Christ. In Christ. To be in Christ is unifying. We do not receive blessings from him. If we did, we would go, we'd take those blessings and we'd go on in our own way and think we're doing something great, right? I've never done anything great in my whole life. I've done a little writing. The best thing for writings that most people that I know, probably the best thing to do would burn them up. Receiving blessings from Christ is a separation idea, but receiving them in him, do you see the difference, is a unifying idea. We can't receive from him and walk on our own. Can't do that. Without me, you can do nothing. That applies even after conversion. From start to finish, we never stand apart from him, but in him. Paul uses that expression very often, in Christ. And I have to say, we can never have Christ in us unless we are in Christ. It won't happen. The truth is that we're saved in the person of another. Is that a humbling idea or what? We're saved in the person of another. Let's look at verse 4, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Present continuous tense. And verses 5 and 6. Having predestinated, what does that mean? Foreordained, be another word. Having predestinated, us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to his good pleasure, to the praise and glory of his grace, wherein he, what's the tense here, hath, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. This is all written in the present continuous tense. These are blessings that we don't look for in the not yet. These are blessings in the now. We can have them now. There are some things for the not yet, but... We're not there yet, right? Total acceptance in Christ. That's what these verses say. Total acceptance in Christ before we were ever even born. Is that faith building or what? Somebody designed this whole thing, put it together. The plan of salvation, even the great God could not have made a better plan. Titus, little book. Titus, chapter 2, verse 14. <clears throat> A little bit before Hebrews. Titus 2, verse 14. It says, everybody have it? Amen? Amen. Who gave himself, what does it say? For us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Do good works fall? I'm talking about sanctification here, okay? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me because the Holy Spirit comes in as I give my heart to Jesus and I'm a justified believer. You know we need to be justified believers every moment of every day. Put your faith and trust in righteousness is by what? 
faith in the doing and suffering of another. He gave himself for us, and a transaction is involved here. Galatians 2.20 says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but what? Christ who lives within me. You can never have Christ within unless you are in him. Justification and sanctification go together. Sometimes you'll find those ideas within the same verse, often in, if in the same chapter. They go together. So why did he give himself for us? Galatians 1.4, Ephesians 1.4, Galatians 1.4, I'm sorry. Galatians, why did he give himself for us? I can't quote this one. I was going to try to quote it. Galatians 1.4, right before Ephesians. He gave himself for our sins that he might what? Deliver us. That's why he gave himself for us, that he might deliver us from this present evil world, world according to the will of God and our Father. To deliver us from this present world, that includes all the ravages of the time of the end. These were words were written for us. If we believe them, all fear is gone. You remember the Philippian jailer? After the earthquake and all the trouble that happened, what must I do to be saved? And Paul turns to him and says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Our job is to believe. This is the work of God that you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Because when we do that and give ourselves to him in a meaningful way, a miracle happens. It's called the miracle of the new birth. And all fear is gone. The Old Testament church entered in, why? They entered not in, I'm sorry, why? Because of unbelief. They'd seen all the miracles. They didn't believe it could happen. They, wouldn't, they, they weren't going to walk around the walls of Jericho, no way. They all knew about the Red Sea. They saw the water from the rock. God always gives us something to hang our belief on. So the Old Testament church entered in not because of unbelief. He gave himself for our sins, but there's a price tag to all of this. He purchased us. He paid all that we owed to a broken law. You know, there's a parable of Jesus about the two debtors. You remember that parable? That first debtor owed more than he could possibly pay in a, in a million lifetimes. And he was forgiven that. That's us. And so we owe a huge debt to the law of God. And he came. And this is not cheap grace because it costs somebody a lot to get it for us. Who pays for something that they don't want? Anybody ever do that? Sometimes I get home and I wonder if I wanted it or not. <laughs> I bought a little lap computer here a while back. And I'm not computer literate at all, not even a little bit, not even this much. And uh, yesterday, I thought, that wasn't for my brother Steve coming over and giving me a little bit of help. I was about ready to put it back in the box and leave it there. In fact, I said something like that, didn't I, Steve? <laughs> I'm not ready to bag it. <laughs> Who pays for something they don't want? Just me. Not only does he want us because he paid our way and he stands for us in heavenly places. He ever lives to make intercession for us. There's a, there's a reason why he predestinated us to be saved. We read it in Ephesians 1, 4, and 5. That we might be holy and blameless. He has faith in us. You know, we talk to people who say, have faith in God. But he has faith in us. He has enough faith in us that when we really get it and we really see what he did and the price he paid and all the trimmings that go along with that, that we'll, that we'll, that we'll, that we'll, re that we'll believe it. It's a walk, not a work. 
Because when you begin to know Jesus by studying his word, and that's why we should study it, you begin to walk with him. It's a walk, not a work. There's a difference. So, uh, Matthew 6, 29, it says, this is the work of God, that you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's, that's the work, believe. Give ourselves to Jesus in a meaningful way, Lord. You know, when we get up in the morning, get out of the bed in the morning, it's getting a little easier, easier for me to get out of bed now. First couple of times I had a little hard time. When I get up in the morning and have our feet on the floor, give yourself to Jesus in the morning. Make that your very first work. The only way we can do it is if we look in the right direction, especially in the troubled times that we're living in. I found a little while back that I was watching the news too much. I've cut back on that a little bit. <laughs> Isaiah 45. Isaiah 45. Isaiah, that uh, major prophet. I just love reading Isaiah. Let's read verses 22 to 25. Isaiah 45, 22 to 25. Look unto me. Look in the right place. He says, look unto me and be ye saved all ye ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. I have sworn by myself. There's no higher name that he can swear by, Right? I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. Surely shall one say in the Lord, I have I righteousness and strength. Even in him shall all men come, and all that are incensed against him shall be ashamed. In the Lord shall all the seed of Israel be justified and show glory. And uh, Isaiah 51, verse 5. Isaiah 51, verse 5. You recognize that today we're entering a new church year. Pray for your church. Somebody suggested to me this morning that we have a dedication for all the church officers. Nothing I'd like better. Maybe the next time I meet here, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. And maybe have a dedicatory prayer. Think where you'd like to have this church be in three months from now, in five months from now. We've got a message for the nations. But our nation is right here in Sierra Vista. Uh, Isaiah 50, 51, verse 1. Hearken to me, ye that follow after righteousness, ye that seek the Lord, look, what is the word? Look unto the rock whence you were hewn, are hewn, and to the hole of the pit whence you were digged. So uh, it's look and live. You have the same thing in, uh, in Christ's uh, little night interview with Nicodemus. Look and live. In verse 14 of chapter 3 of John, he talks about the brazen serpent in the wilderness. Those people out there in the wilderness that time, they were fiery serpents had come in and they were the dead and dying all around. And God told Moses, make a serpent out of brass, put it high on a pole and have the people look and they'll live. And uh, they did. And it seems foolish. With God, things, you know, God's things are foolishness to man. It seems foolish that a brazen serpent on a pole could heal, uh, how many, I don't know how many people, maybe 500,000 of them. It's a miracle. It's like the miracle of a new birth. He can heal the world. And uh, again and again, we're saved by looking. If we keep our eyes in the right direction, faith will be born. And faith brings a strong love for Jesus. And Jesus once said, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's the pathway to sanctification. But it first comes by looking. 
You cannot live a sanctified life without looking to Jesus and spending some special time with him every day, studying his word, searching the word for inspiration. Well, my sermons are way too long. I'm only halfway through, so I'm going to quit. And I can't give you the rest of this the next time I'm here because I'd have to start in the middle someplace. So I'm not going to do that. So uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop here. But uh, I'd like to have just a, a concluding thought or two. Uh, it's not enough to just to know about Jesus. But we need to know him. My favorite text in all the Bible is Jeremiah 24, verse 7. Let's turn to that one. I've just taken away three pages of notes and I'm almost done. Jeremiah 24, verse 7. Notice who does this. This does not come from us. Jeremiah 24, verse 7. Say amen if you have it. Let's all feast our eyes on this. Uh, as Paul Harvey used to say, wash out your eyes with this. He used to say ears, right? We listen to him. And I will give them a heart to know me. It all starts with God. I will give them a heart to know me, that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, for they shall return unto me with their what? with the whole heart. Now, these last concluding uh, words that I'm going to say, we're all familiar with First, Th First uh, Thessalonians chapter 4. And one of those verses is, The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And uh, comfort each other with these words, he says. The fourth chapter of 1 Thessalonians is about the second coming of Christ. But the fifth chapter of 1 Thessalonians is about how we get ready for the coming. So in closing, I'd like to have us turn to 1 Thessalonians 5. I'd like to read that chapter. It won't take long. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. This is how we be ready for the coming. This is how we be ready to face another day to face a new and uncertain week. We don't know what's going to happen. One morning we're going to wake up and everything's going to be different. Lamont won't go to his work that day. And uh, whoever here works won't go to their work that day. It's going to be all different. Everything changes in a moment. And so we should not be getting ready. We should be ready every day. Jesus said, be also ready. Be ready. Be ready. But this is how we be ready. So let's read this chapter. I'm going to read it rapidly. Not out of irreverence either. But here's what it says. But of the times and seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write to you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord is coming as a what? Thief in the night. When the thief comes, he doesn't throw rocks on your roof and, and wake you up first, does he? No, he sneaks stealthily through a window. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with a child, and they shall not escape. Why are these words in the Bible? They're in the Bible because it's not always going to be this way. With the COVID virus and everything, we have been in relative safety and comfort, haven't we? Even with all that. But it isn't going to always be this way. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day shall overtake you as a thief. Ye are the children, ye are all, ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. They that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. 
Wherefore, comfort each other. Comfort yourselves together. and Edify one another, even also as ye do. And we beseech you, brethren, to know, to know them that labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem every one of them very highly in love for the work's sake. And be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the, uh, the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient to all men. See that none render evil, and evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Do you see why this, why this chapter is here? He's just been talking in chapter 4 about the second coming. We ask the question, you want to see Jesus come? You want to see Jesus come if he's not ready? No, that's a woeful idea. Verse 16, rejoice evermore. Did you find something to rejoice about this week? I can stand on this other leg now. And I can walk, and it doesn't hurt me as much now as it did before I had the surgery two, two weeks ago. Pray without ceasing. How do you do that? Can we always be in a prayerful attitude? We can, can't we? Lift your voice to God in your thoughts, in your mind, as you're driving down the road. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit. Despise not prophesyings. Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. That's W-H-O-L-L-Y, completely. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you and also will do it. Brethren, pray for us. Greet the brethren with a holy kiss. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read unto the holy brethren. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. That's our appeal today. I had here, I couldn't remember if we were, uh, if we were singing from the hymnal, but uh, there's a song that we sing, Only Believe, and we're not going to sing it this morning. But um, you, you know the words of that song, Only Believe, all things are possible, but only what? Believe. Okay. And faith and belief comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Spend some time every day. Could we covenant together to spend some time every day in the word? for the purpose of knowing Jesus better and to have this and to be united with him, yoked up with him, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Shall we pray? Dear Father in heaven, I want to thank you, Lord, for this little church family. It's an inspiration to me to see people who like to study the Bible and like to know these things. I pray, Father, that you be with each one, each one here according to our several needs, and we have a lot of needs, Lord. There's some here today who are grieving, perhaps over the loss of a loved one. People who may be going through high water, deep water, with finances, or maybe even a marriage. People who are worried about their health. Lord, take all the fear away from us. Help us to realize that you're in charge. And uh, I pray that you will will grant each one according to our several needs. Help us to have faith in Jesus. Give us trust, a trust that cannot be shaken when the mark of the beast is urged upon us. May we be ready for the times ahead. And I pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.